In this episode, we are going to talk about weather and climate gateway too. So if you have any questions, do feel free to put them down in the comments below. You can DM me your questions on Instagram. And yeah, without further ado, let's start. Now, when it comes to weather and climate gateway too, uh, you will realize that the focus is actually on climate change. Now, whenever I ask my students about climate change, the common response that I get would be global warming, right? So global warming, yes, is part of climate change, but if we really understand the term climate change in entirety, um, it's not actually just referring to global warming only, but with the recent media attention that's placed on global warming, and you have the student activist Greta Thunberg, or you have UK, right, the extinction rebellion that's going on um, it's normal for us to assume that um, climate change basically refers to global warming let's take a step back and really understand about climate change so the word change itself suggests that apart from global warming we should also pay attention to global cooling right so um, now if you look at your textbook you will notice that they actually separate it into two different points. So what causes climate change? You have the natural processes as well as the anthropogenic factors. So um, I would say that for natural processes, to understand this, we need to look at the Earth's climatic conditions since historical times. If we really analyse through um, ice cores as well as other forms of scientific research, we would realise that the Earth's temperature have been fluctuating in cycles of warming and cooling phases um, since millions of years ago and all these um, phases of warming and cooling cannot be explained um, by human interference right we cannot say that oh millions of years ago we have burnt fossil fuels and that's why there was the warming phase so in order to explain this there are a couple of different factors but um, we will focus on variations in solar output that would be one and um, now if you understand from your textbook Variations in solar output actually happens in an 11-year cycle. So on the sun itself, there will be sunspots that will appear. And sunspots are basically cooler regions on the sun. So the surrounding regions of the sunspot will now emit greater amounts of solar radiation to compensate the cooler temperatures of the sunspot. So when greater amount of solar radiation is being emitted, the Earth's temperature will now increase. Right. So basically, um, with variations in solar output, this will actually lead to fluctuations in the Earth's temperature. But of course, this itself is not enough to account for the recent drastic increase in global temperatures. So therefore, if you're required to explain about why um, there's recent increase in global temperatures, do not use this point, right? But if you would like to justify why the Earth's temperature has been fluctuating throughout Earth's history, then this point would be ideal. Okay, so next we have volcanic eruptions. Now, Take note that I've added two more words in front over here, large scale. Um, the reason is because not all volcanic eruptions will actually lead to a change in global temperatures. Uh, it must be a large scale volcanic eruption. And if you recall the past video that I mentioned on plate tectonics, uh, when I talk about volcanic eruptions, I mentioned that um, volcanoes do not only produce lava and volcanic ash, they also produce volcanic gases. Now in this case, one form of volcanic gas will be sulfur dioxide. So when sulfur dioxide dioxide reacts with the water vapor in the atmosphere, what happens is that it helps to form sulfate aerosols. And sulfate aerosols is basically particles that can help to reflect solar energy back into space. So imagine if there's a lot of sulfate aerosols suspended in the atmosphere. What happens is that most of the solar energy may be reflected to space, so therefore it results in temporary cooling of regional or global temperatures. So the example that's given in a textbook would be Mount Pinatubo that erupted in 19 and it resulted in a 0.6 degrees Celsius decrease in the global temperature for a couple of weeks or months. Now, all these are temporary because eventually, after everything has settled, it will um, the temperatures will revert back to the same. Um, so therefore, when it comes to explaining why uh, there is global warming in recent years, of course, this is not an ideal point. But if you would like to explain why there are fluctuations in the temperatures and especially to explain why there's a decrease in the Earth's temperature, then it would be ideal to use this point about large-scale volcanic eruptions. Okay, so next, 
Um, now, you would notice that apart from natural processes, we have anthropogenic factors. Now, this is actually the main um, explanation as to why the Earth's temperature has been increasing drastically and rapidly in the past two centuries. Um, so, this anthropogenic factors basically is referring to what humans have done to increase the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, we are looking at things like burning of fossil fuels or um, basically deforestation. So when we practice all these different human activities, um, we are actually contributing to something called enhanced greenhouse effect. So now, enhanced greenhouse effect um, is different from greenhouse effect itself because greenhouse effect is basically um, something that's beneficial for the earth. Okay, so um, now think about this this way. Um, now, with greenhouse effect, what happens is that the Earth's temperature is being regulated because the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere can help to absorb heat. And this heat can be radiated back into the atmosphere and therefore warming the Earth and making it conducive for living organisms to survive. Right? But on the other hand, if you think about human activities that are practiced on a large scale, um, you will notice that the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has increased drastically. So more heat is being absorbed by all these greenhouse gases and therefore this will lead to something called enhanced greenhouse effect where there's a lot of heat being generated and a lot of heat being retained in the atmosphere which therefore results in increased global temperatures. Alright, so basically when you unpack um, the point about anthropogenic factors, you will notice that your textbook focuses on deforestation as well as changing land use. Now I will say that before you read through all this, uh, take a step back and ask yourself what are the main causes for deforestation and changing land use to even happen in the first place. Now if you really think hard about it, it can only boil down to two main points which is population growth and economic development. Now, think about this, population growth. By 2050, the world's population will increase to 10 billion. If we have more people, now the demand for different resources will therefore increase. So therefore, it drives the need to practice deforestation to make space for different uses such as agriculture, uh, residential, commercial as well as industrial use. Alright, so that's why population growth plays an important role. And next we have economic development. Now, if you look around Southeast Asia, a lot of countries are developing rapidly. At the same time, if you look at the four main countries, BRIC, um, Brazil, Russia, India and China, you will notice that their economic development is happening at a very fast pace. So because of this, people's disposable income will increase drastically as well and therefore people's purchasing power will now increase drastically as well. So if people now have increased purchasing power, their demand for different goods will also increase. So therefore their lifestyle will change, um, they will consume more meat rather than staple food and that's why this will also drive the need to um, change the use of our land to make space for greater amounts of land set aside for agricultural purposes to cater to the demand of people who are more affluent. So therefore, it really, if you think about this, deforestation and changing of land use, the main reason is because of population growth and economic development. Alright, so next we are going to look at how anthropogenic factors can actually lead to various consequences. So and in your textbook, there are four main consequences and three of which are negative and one positive, depending on how you see it. Um, but I would say sea level rise is actually the most important consequence to pay attention to because it is something that leads to global impact. Now, sea level rise is actually caused by two things, the melting of the ice sheets and glaciers, as well as the fact that the seas and the oceans will expand with increased global temperatures. So because of this, this will actually pose a threat to all the low-lying countries and cities as well as the islands around the world. So basically, when we are explaining about sea level rise, use statistics to support. Your textbook has a number of different statistics such as um, 600 million people are living in coastal areas, things like that. So do make sure that you pay attention to statistics like this so that you can enhance your answer further. And apart from sea level rise, the next one would be increased scale of spread of infectious uh, insect-borne diseases. Now this has something to do with the chapter of health. So for core geography students, use the chapter of health um, to help you explain and justify this point. But for students who are doing elective geography, they are not doing the chapter of health, don't worry. 
the key understanding is that with increased global warming all right there is actually a change in the weather patterns but at the same time this can also lead to increased frequency of extreme weather events such as tropical cyclones now when tropical cyclones hit a particular country um, it not only brings about strong wind it can bring about um, torrential rain as well as storm surge and this too can actually lead to inland flooding and if a country doesn't have proper drainage system, there will be accumulation of stagnant water. So stagnant water will be ideal for mosquitoes to breed, right? So this will facilitate the spread of infectious insect-borne diseases. And notice the term scale over here. It is because insect-borne diseases such as malaria and um, dengue fever are usually confined within tropical regions um, because mosquitoes tend to survive in warmer climates. But with global warming, what's happening here is that the global temperature increases, right? So therefore, the infectious insect-borne diseases will no longer be confined within the tropics. And therefore, um, it's easy to explain that um, with global warming, the scale at which the spread of insect-borne disease will actually increase as well. Okay, so next we have increased frequency of extreme weather events. Now this, um, your textbook actually focuses on heat waves. Now heat waves is actually a global impact. So good that you can bring it up if you want to use the concept of scale of impact. But if not, you can actually talk about tropical cyclone as well. Now do understand that tropical cyclones do not affect all countries and in fact it only affect regions that are within the tropics or in the subtropical region so um, and it only affect coastal cities and coastal countries so therefore I would say that um, use when you want to use this point think through it carefully first but it's good to mention about this especially if you're a core geography student so that you can use your gateway three knowledge to help you justify and explain increased temperature means that the ocean surface temperature may increase as well and this is also a fuel for tropical cyclones so therefore um, instead of just focusing on the frequency of tropical cyclones you do also notice that the strength of the tropical cyclone can increase as well and therefore create greater amounts of destruction Okay, so um, yeah, it depends on which point you're talking about. If it's heat wave, it will be global impact. If it's tropical cyclone, it will be a regional impact. Okay, so yeah, so basically we have talked about all three negative consequences, but of course um, there are some positive consequences if you actually look at um, this point, lengthening of growing season. So uh, when we grow agricultural crops, um, they're dependent on the temperature as well as the amount of water. So if temperature increases globally, uh, this means that the crops that are usually grown in tropical regions can be grown in the subtropical regions. Right, so uh, therefore it can bring about economic benefit for some agricultural farmers depending on where they are located. Um, so it's location specific, therefore the scale of impact is limited. So this point itself, it only benefits some agricultural farmers. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the different strategies that countries can implement to help them overcome or mitigate the challenges of uh, global warming. So in this case, first we've got to recognize that different places actually experience specific climate-related challenges. Now, what do I mean by this? And I underline the term specific. The reason is because different countries um, have different um, vulnerabilities. So some countries are more vulnerable than others due to their location, their locality. So imagine if you're located along a coastal area and you are um, on low-lying land, of course, one of the main challenges that you should be fearful of would be sea level rise. And for countries that are located in a path of tropical cyclones such as countries like Japan, Taiwan or even the eastern coast of US, you will notice that they are more worried about things such as tropical cyclones and the impacts that it can uh, bring about because of the fact that it will increase in frequency and strength. So therefore, the solutions and the strategies that they will put in place will be different. So basically different countries will have to adopt different national strategies depending on what kind of vulnerabilities they are facing and yeah at the end of the day national strategies are necessary to ensure that the international goals are attainable. I'll talk about this later but um, do understand that national strategies they are really dependent on two things number one political willpower and number two financial resources because political willpower suggests that if a government proposes a strategy they must be able to see through it right at the 
same time, you must also have enough sufficient um, financial resources to help the country to see through it and to make sure that all the strategies that are put in place are actually properly executed. Alright, so next we have to talk about international strategies and we have to first realize that climate change is not an issue that one particular country can solve. Now in this case, it actually requires the coordinated responses from various countries and that's why we have a lot of international agreements such as Kyoto Protocol as well as the Paris Agreement um, that are signed by various countries to commit to the aim. In this case, for the Paris Agreement, the aim was to actually reduce the increase of the global temperature to below 2 degrees Celsius and hopefully reach the aim of below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we also understand that USA have pledged to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So whenever we are trying to answer the overarching question, variable weather and changing climate, a continuing challenge. Now the answer is definitely a yes as of now because uh, if you look around the world right now, um, we are still producing greenhouse gases at a very fast pace. We are not really adopting a lot of alternative energy um, in comparison to our rate of burning of fossil fuels and deforestation is still occurring at a very um, large scale and um, most importantly, um, international agreements, um, even though there are some countries that participate in it but at the end of the day we also have to realize that different countries have different priorities and that's why sometimes it's difficult to achieve the goal that's set out and um, yeah but we can always be hopeful because with greater awareness that's uh, being generated around this issue um, and with all the um, peaceful protests that has been ha happening around the world and the call for governments to actually take action um, hopefully we will not be able to reach a point where climate change will actually lead to irreversible impacts um, and hopefully we will not be able to experience all of that. Alright so I hope this video has been useful in helping you to better understand about climate change, the driving forces of it, uh, the impacts as well as the different strategies and hopefully this uh, entire chapter will make more sense to you and do let me know if you have any questions down in the comments below or you can DM me your questions on Instagram and for core geography students do look out for the next next video where we're going to talk about tropical cyclones and yeah we'll see each other in the next episode